So now I am thrilled to kick off today's event called Achieving Ambitions with Real Life Lessons, a conversation with Nelly Borrero, Managing Director and Senior Strategic Advisor of Global Inclusion and Diversity at Accenture. We created the session today in celebration of International Women's Day, a global holiday celebrated every year on March 8th to commemorate the achievements of women and mark a call to action for gender parity. This day holds a special place in the heart of many, but for Nelly Barrero, it's really been a catalyst in her career. She's a devoted trailblazer and a pioneer of a center's inclusion and diversity practice, which you'll hear more about in a bit. And the conversation will be led by another extraordinary leader, Tamara Fields, who's an office managing director at Accenture, overseeing more than 5,000 employees in Austin. Tamara also serves as a US co-lead for Accenture's Women's Employee Resource Group and the inclusion and diversity lead for Accenture's Austin office. Without any further ado, I'm very excited to hand it over to Tamara. Thanks, Katie. I really appreciate that introduction and welcome to all of the ladies who are on the call and every and all the gentlemen who might be on the call as well today. Um, I, I think it's really important that we take a moment um, in light of the tragedies that are going on uh, in Ukraine. I wanted to start this conversation by acknowledging the people of Ukraine, uh, specifically the women of Ukraine. While many of us can't speak to the challenges that they're facing right now, what we can speak to is that women all over the world need to be and will be celebrated through International Women's Day. And then I hope also in addition with that, that all of us will feel compassion and concern for those of them are going through a strong struggle as they try and, and deal with the difficulties and disruptions that they've had to face over the last several days and several weeks. But when I was talking to Nelly about this last week, she reminded me that there's struggles for women all around the world always. And although that is a really important struggle that we're focused on, it's important that when we think about International Women's Day, that we're talking about all of the struggles of women together. And I think that word international is, is really uh, important. Um, you know, I can say that Nelly and I myself with Nelly, I've had the privilege of traveling with her around the world when she's been encouraging and advocating for equity, inclusion and diversity. Um, and she's done that with a passion, not just for women, but all displaced groups around the world and individuals who require inclusion and equality and a voice and seat at the table. Um, she has always uh, been a mentor of mine. Um, I have known her a great many years and I can honestly say that she has been pivotal to each of the promotion points in my career. I've been a managing director at Accenture for over a decade and she was essential to helping me make senior manager to managing director and even the milestones that I've made throughout this cycle. Um, and in addition to that, not only is she my colleague, she's my friend. Uh, she's someone that I can trust. She's someone who I appreciate. She's someone who I value and she's someone who I admire. And so I'm really excited for everyone on the call today to hear her journey because I think her journey will resonate with you. And I think you'll get nuggets out of our conversation today that will hopefully help you expand your career success because I think we're all in this journey together to help women be successful. And I think that's the best way that we can honor International Women's Day. So you know, Nelly, IWD, it holds a special place in your heart and for a number of reasons. Um, can you share why International Women's Day is special to you and how it's been pivotal in your own career, career success? Absolutely, thank you, Tamara. And before I get started, I share your sentiments uh, when it comes to women of Ukraine and women all over the world and people all over the world. So thank you for starting that way. Um, you know, I'm one of your biggest fans, right? So agreeing to this with you was just a no brainer. I'm like, okay, we're on. Uh, so thank you for taking the time to do this with me. Our journey has been quite special and, and quite honestly a gift. So International Women's Day, I, I just think it is a moment to remind women and men and anyone, whatever you identify as, right? What your orientation is, right? your identity is, is to really think about what are some of the progress that we've made. So what's the progress we've made and where do we still have gaps? What do we still need to advocate for and become an ally for? So as I think about International Women's Day, I always go back to when I began focusing on this many, many years ago. And we at Accenture took on a huge role around IWD. And it just kept building year on year. And while it was building, I was kind of behind the scenes for a while, just helping build that. 
And then one particular year I said, you know what? I'm not gonna be behind the scenes anymore. I'm gonna be front and center. And I decided to go on that big platform stage that was going to be seen all over the world. And I decided that at that moment, I was gonna encourage women to take up their space, even if they have concerns, even if they have fears, just choose to take up your space. And I did that. And one of the first things I did when I got on that stage was I decided that I was gonna claim my name. And claiming my name meant that I was not gonna introduce myself as Nelly Borrero. I was gonna say Nelly Borrero because I know how to pronounce my name. Um, and I decided that from now on, I don't expect anyone else to pronounce it the way I do and not roll the R's the way I roll the R's. But if I'm able to do it, that's how I'm gonna show up in the world. So I appreciate Katie when she introduced me, she got really close. So thank you, Katie. <laughs> I love that. You know, I think it's it's something that um, you just said that just kind of strikes me. You said, I decided. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's an important phrasing because I think sometimes we don't recognize how much power we have individually to make a decision on how we're going to show up. And, you know, when I was thinking about this next question, right, our, our next question was, you know, you're, you know, why do you think you're considered a trailblazer in the inclusion and diversity space? And, but I think I had to come back to not only why do you think you're considered a trailblazer, right? It's that conversation around how you decided to show up, created the ability for you to be a trailblazer, right? And can you tie those together for me? Because I think it's important to talk about, we often talk about Nelly courage and how you show up, but I just, I couldn't leave us without us thinking about that because I think sometimes we don't really understand the level of the power that we have in, regardless of the environment we might be in. Thank you, Tamara, for that. And I would say it starts with understanding your purpose. Um, I understood my purpose very early on. As a child, I was always the one leading and always the one you know, fighting my way through things that I wasn't supposed to be involved in. So it, it just comes very natural for me to understand my purpose and my need to advocate. As I entered the corporate environment, it was clear that I was one of a few, or some would say, and we don't still know if this is true, the first Latina hire, um, you know, in the US at the time, and I was in the New York office. So entering this environment was not an easy environment, but it was one that I felt was part of my journey and one that I felt that I couldn't just keep all to myself, but I had to share with others like me. So as I think about, you know, how this all came about and wanting to really solve for other people, including myself, it was really easy to understand my purpose, what I was looking to accomplish, and who I, I was going to bring along the ride with me to make that happen. Because I knew that I was going to need some influential people to help me close some gaps that were clearly in existence at the time. So I think for all of us that are going through our journey, whether you're in the beginning of that journey, the middle of that journey, or you're at the tail end of that journey and transition to something else in your life, is asking yourself, have you done or are you doing everything you need to do to feel good about advocating for yourself advocating for others and lifting others as you are lifted as well. So I think it's a combination of understanding also your courage, how courageous are you going to be uh, mm -hmm. in that process because it takes courage and it takes courage to sort of pause and ask yourself, am I where I want to be? And that question is critical for me because if the answer to that is no, then I have no other choice but to disrupt and agitate with good intentions to get to where I wanna be. Oh, we're going to come back to this. I have to disrupt and agitate in just a second. But before I go to that question, I want to come back to this conversation around purpose and passion, right? And I also want to come back that trailblazer, what does that word mean in its essence? It really means first, right? Usually a lot of times when people put trailblazer out there is that you're doing something new. You're doing something that someone else hasn't done, or you're doing it in a different way than what others have done. And so, you know, one of the things I think about, can you tell just a little bit, right? Like you were at your fifth year anniversary and presenting to the Accenture board. Like someone would say, that's a trailblazing opportunity mm -hmm. and moment, right? When I think through my own career, I haven't presented to the Accenture board yet. And, and I've been a senior leader in this company for a long time. That, that's, a, that's a pretty big deal. You know, thank you, Tamara. And, and it's interesting because the way that came about was I was actually at Accenture for many years already. Um, it was the fifth year anniversary of Accenture going public. 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, not too many people had an opportunity to present on the board or in the boardroom. And it's something that rarely happens um, internally. But I got this call that the board was interested in understanding what we were doing around the space of diversity at the time. We weren't talking a lot about inclusion, about equality and equity, right? It's, it's been a journey. This has been a journey has evolved throughout the years. And when I got that call, I'm thinking, oh, goodness, first of all, I'm supposed to go on vacation with my best friend, her husband, and my, and, um, and my hubby, and I will have to rethink that vacation um, and try to figure out how I'm going to make this work. Second is my first year at Accenture was very, very challenging. Uh, it, it took a lot to be able to navigate through that first year to the point that I resigned three months into my, uh, my role. So I said to myself, this is a moment that I have been waiting for that is now in front of me. I got to seize it. I got to take that seat at the table and own it. Um, and own it meant to me, Tamara, that I had to feel good about myself. So I went and bought myself a slamming new suit. Um, <laughs> I went and got a whole bunch of new makeup because I was like, I am going to go in there and I'm going to feel like I've conquered the world, right? It's the things that we do for ourselves, whatever that is, that's what worked for me. And I prepared and prepared and prepared. And when I walked into the uh, New York Stock Exchange, which is where that meeting took place, um, and I saw a reflection of myself as I was walking through one of the panels of the revolving door, I remember saying to myself, I can't believe I am here. Mm -hmm. um, and then as I left after presenting in this beautiful, elegant room, um, and I was on my way out, I said, no, stay longer. Um, so I stayed a little bit longer and hung out with the board members. Um, I walked out saying, I earned the opportunity to be here. Mm. So it's not that I can't believe I'm here, it's that the moment has arrived. And on the way, I had changed my flight to go later that night to meet my friend Blanca in Puerto Rico and my husband and her husband. And uh, I was in a car with the COO of our organization at the time, Steve Rowleader. And we were riding in the car and I'm thinking to myself, mm, I'm in this car with our COO. I mean, I've come a long way, but I'm going to believe that I'm here because I've earned it. Um, so that's been that journey is when you're a trailblazer, you, you get all these opportunities, but you have to remind yourself, they didn't come by sheer luck. They came because you worked so hard to position yourself there. There were sacrifices along the way, but they all seem worth it when you've accomplished something that is that big and that important. Oh, yeah. I, there's so much in that I can't even... But before I go on to, hey, I earned it, because we're going to come back, everybody, and unpeel the I earned it statement, we got to go back to the disrupt and agitate with good attention. And I think it's really important, because the first thing that you said when you were telling that story is I got a call because they wanted to understand what we were doing around inclusion and diversity. Mm -hmm. So I want everybody to take a pause there because what happens in that statement, it was clear that Nellie had established her brand as a person tied to the conversation, inclusion and diversity. And when you started Nellie, that concept, that discipline, that um, capability, that offering, right, didn't really exist at an expansive level. And, and that goes back to the word again, trailblazer, right? Like, how do you have the audacity and again, the word courage to not only advocate for yourself, but others, right? Um, so that you ultimately created a role, a practice that, that not only extends in our North America company, but globally, right? So we have a global inclusion and diversity practice. We have a global inclusion and diversity program um, with expansive learning and retention and, and, and all sorts of just wonderful aspects to it from recruitment to retention, to learning, to all sorts of things at all levels that I myself have personally benefited on. I told you even at the start of this call, we were kicking off a, a program that we have for women senior leaders who are doing a great job. I was in that same program that was a pivotal, pivotal in helping me move into becoming a managing director. What, what, what is this? I, I'm going to go disrupt and agitate with good intention and have the audacity to go push forward a concept that created all of this. Thank you, Tamara. Um, I would say that it, it really goes back to I just cannot sit and just be a witness to things that just don't seem right. Um, I always felt that I put myself in situations that again, I have prepared for, but I just didn't want to settle there. Um, you know, th there's this dynamic 
that we have, that we, we have to be so thankful. And yes, we're blessed in many ways. And believe me, I'm a very spiritual person. Um, I, I embrace those blessings, but I also don't just sit back and say, well, I've accomplished all that I was meant to accomplish or all that this environment will allow me to accomplish. And it was that that taught me very early on that I was going to create opportunities, not only for me around this diversity space, which really wasn't popular when I started this, right? It wasn't, it wasn't the, the popular thing to do and align your brand to back then. As a matter of fact, it was the worst thing to do because it was always so challenging for your career to be the one to be the advocate um, and be the voice of those that felt that they were not being embraced. Um, but I am a very proud person, but I always manage that too. Um, and I would say to myself, I will not be denied and I will not have others like me be denied. And that was the simple line that I would just say to myself and I would just push through it. And it goes back to what I said earlier, Tamara, right? You have, you have this purpose and you have this intention and you know it's not gonna be easy. So you align yourself with people that you need help from, which I didn't understand very early on, but I understood that as I went along. And it was really changing the hearts and minds of some people to really come along. And that was also getting to a place of not taking things personal. Because when I would go reach out to some people and they're like, no, no, thank you. I'm not interested in getting involved in that, right? I just couldn't take it personal. I had to just move on and go to the next person that was going to align with me. But agitating, disrupting, I'll clarify it a little bit or evolve, I should say, around what I said, or elaborate is really the right word. To elaborate on that, the, when you want to create cultural change, and when you want to create an environment that's more inclusive, it is going to require some disruption because we're changing the norm. It is going to require a little bit of agitating because some people will feel agitated because they're going to have fear of change. At the same time, I go back to that word intention. If the intention is to solve for others and solve for yourself in a way that is going to benefit the community, the culture, and certain people across many demographics, then you go ahead and you put that foot forward and you fight right through. And that's what I mean by agitating and disrupt because if we don't have people with that courage to do that, we will not see the change that was meant to happen for all of us. I appreciate that a lot. I, I think I don't wanna leave this conversation without you specifically talking about the fact that you initiated, right? The first full-time diversity role in Accenture in the early nineties. And that's important, right? Because I think it's pretty bold to go out there and say, hey, I, this is why we should be doing this and this is important. It's another thing to say, hey, I want you to financially you know, support me taking on a full-time IND role. Um, can, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so, so it started with you know, me just adding this to my daily role um, and just engaging with people and saying, I, I wanna see more women. I wanna see more people like me. I want to see more um, people of color um, in our organization. So I started doing it as a side thing. And then I said to myself at one point, I'm like, mm -mm, this should be so important to our organization that someone should be paid to do this full time. I just had that awareness. It just meant a lot to me to have someone be the one doing that. And that someone I decided was going to be me. So I started asking and asking is so hard, especially when you're advocating for yourself and you're asking for yourself. But I started asking leaders, what do I need to do to have this be a full-time role? So Tamara, you know, timing is everything, right? Um, and you and strategically positioning yourself is also really smart, right? So when I went on for about, I wanna say maybe a year and a half, just really trying to position myself for this role, there was this meeting going on in the New York office and it was gonna be all the leaders that are making decisions about payroll, headcount, this, that, and all the things that were important to me getting this role. So I went into the office that day and they were meeting in a, in a room on the 12th floor, which had glass panels. So I started walking back and forth, back and forth, because I knew they were all in there. And I want them to see me as they were talking about me and the role that I wanted. So I kept going back and forth. And finally, one of the leaders just pulled me and I said, okay, now you can stop walking back and forth. We're gonna give you the role. Um, but my whole point there was, I am going to be seen because I know I've already been heard. So I wanted to make sure that I combined the power of both in that moment to make sure that we got to the result that I felt was important for our organization and for me. But it doesn't stop there, Tamara, right? Because you could get the role, 
you get the role, but then it goes back to what I said earlier. You can't settle for just that. I wanted the role. I got the role. I needed a budget to be able to execute and get the resources to get things done. But I also didn't want my title to stay the same. I kept pushing to continue to grow within our organization. There was no blueprint for my role to get from you know, a consultant to manager to senior manager to managing director at the time was senior executive. Um, so for every promotion cycle that I felt I was ready, I would go and advocate for myself. It's not easy to do, but it's necessary because if you don't do it, guess what? You're gonna be really mad at yourself. And I really don't like being mad at myself. I don't mind others being mad at me, me being mad at other people, we can work that out, but I will lose sleep if I am mad at myself. So I kept pushing to make sure that they understood. And one leader asked me, why is it so important to you to get to the next level? And I said two very, very key reasons. Number one is because I've earned it. And number two is because if we're going to take this role seriously, it's got to be at the level where I'm viewed as a very powerful leader that's going to be able to influence change and get things done. So you always have to have an answer prepared to the why. Um, so I would say to all of you that are listening today, whatever that point is in your journey and whatever that why is, make sure you have an audience that you have identified to share that with so you can get to the next level and you continue to grow within your own journey. Yeah, I love that. I, you know, I think it's interesting that um, sometimes we have to advocate and advocating, we have to help people understand that why we are deserving of the next step on the ladder. And it's always interesting to me how sometimes people don't understand their own clouded view or even their own unconscious bias <laughs> that presents them from seeing the reality of the picture. Um, and, and, and I see questions coming in for the audience. Y'all keep them coming. I'm going to get to them shortly. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit around, you made a comment around changing the hearts and minds of the leaders that you were interacting with. And I think that's a pretty interesting statement because I think as humans, it's, it's hard to change people's points of view mm -hmm. and to influence them. And I think the word influence is, is, is the key part of that conversation, right? And, you know, you're, you're working with, um, you know, at this point, right, you're an established practitioner. Um, people understand that you are an inclusion, diversity, and I like to say an equity practitioner mm -hmm. um, on a global scale as well as here in North America. Um, and so as a role, right, you, you have to influence C-suite leaders all the time, right, in executing initiatives and amplifying and embracing diversity. This is hard to do. Um, can you talk about, you know, how do you help them understand the importance of this topic and it not just be a conversation, but something that they, that they have to execute on? And, and how do you influence senior leaders, um, you know, to this path? Yeah, Tamara, thank you. I think that's a great question. You know, it's interesting because when I'm talking to leaders across industry um, and we're talking about how do we increase our diversity within, you know, their organization? How do we create greater inclusion? Um, I always say to them that it really is going to take a path of being willing to be the leader to make those changes. Um, and change is hard. But then I follow that by saying, if you're not willing to be that leader that is going to take those steps, then you're going to be the leader that's going to continue to admire the problem. And once I say that, leaders do not want to sit back and be accused of admiring a problem, right? I mean, what do leaders do? We solve. Everybody solves for, for problems. And, and then I get into the why is it important to align the brand to be focused, quite honestly, on human rights, on social justice, because I and D, as we think about it, and equality and equity and belonging, all the things you want to call it. And I tell people, call it what you want to call it, as long as you're doing something about it, right? Um, what we have to understand is, I talked about the evolution of this. And we, when we think about inclusion and diversity and equality, all these things today, we think about how we as leaders and the brands that we're aligning ourselves to our time, our energy, our skills, how are they leveraging that brand to solve for social injustices? Diversity has aligned itself to a much bigger, bigger calling as I think about it holistically. So with leaders, what I talk about is, what are you looking to solve for internally? How do we strategize around that? 
but how are you looking to leverage the amazing talent that you have within your organization to close gaps across communities, to leverage your brand, to solve for things that are going to help people evolve and create greater livelihoods. So the conversation is, is a broad conversation. Um, and then I get into a very personal driven conversation. What are the biases that ex exist for them, right? Because we all have biases, Chama, right? It's part of our human nature. We have them. I catch myself sometimes. And I, you know, the thing with bias is that once you're aware that they're showing up, you have a responsibility and an accountability to yourself. And that is to recognize it and do something about it. But sometimes people don't even recognize what bias they carry. So my engagement is let's understand your bias. And let's walk through where you're uncomfortable and where you can get comfortable because it is a conversation. It is having that awareness. And, and I love when I get into those conversations because some are really challenging and some are really tough, but I always walk out and I say, I am who I am, no matter where I am. So I'm going to have the courage to challenge a leader, no matter where they sit, because if I'm getting paid, to do this, I got to come up in a way that I am going to have a conversation that's going to add value. Yeah, I know. It's very interesting. And there's a couple of questions in here. I can't wait to get to you around belonging. But even before we get there, I want to talk a little bit about servant leadership, because I think part of, you know, you've talked about passion, you've talked about purpose, right? You, you felt clearly, it's clear that you felt that a, a passion for inclusion and diversity, you felt this was part of your purpose, and that's, you've made it your career. But I also want to talk about servant leadership, because I think that, you know, Ellie, when I think about my own career, you have served me through your career. Um, and I think that the, the, you know, the best leaders aren't just leaders who lead, but leaders who serve. Mm -hmm. All right. And how do you serve? Right. You serve by um, making yourself available to people. You serve by supporting them when they have questions for you. And you've done that for me immeasurably, repeatedly, right? Even when I just took on this last role that I had, it was a big step up in my career. I was dealing with very senior leaders and I felt very intimidated. And you reminded me of who I was. You reminded me that I earned it. You reminded me that it's it's okay to have grace um, to, to learn and, 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 and to come up to speed. Um, and, but it was just, it was interesting to me that, you know, um, the advice that you've given me through each kind of critical step of my career from sponsorship to reminding me of who I am, to reminding me of how to represent my voice, um, to reminding me how to recover when I've made a mistake, right? Like we, we've covered it all uh, in the span of a couple of decades. Um, but the thing that strikes me the most is that you've always entered those conversations from a, from a place of good intention and a place of servant leadership. And, and as a result, I'm very excited because I've heard through the grapevine, I've heard rumblings mm -hmm. that you might be doing a book. And I really hope that that's you know, true, Nelly, because I, when I think about the wisdom that you've given me through that career, I think there are many who could benefit from that. And that could really be kind of that next substantiation of servant leadership. Can, can you talk about, is there going to be a book, Nelly? <laughs> yes, Tara, thank you. Uh, there is going to be a book. Um, I am halfway there uh, working with an incredible team. It is so interesting because I do want to get into the book, but I have to share a story with you, Tara, right? Because we've, we've had such an incredible journey. It's such a gift, um, the journey that we've had together. And I remember being on the Acela train from, I was going from New York to DC. And I happened to get into the, I sat in the quiet cart, right? And you just can't speak. You got to stay quiet and all these different things, right? And I see you calling me and, I, and I'm like, mm, I better pick up this call, right? So I know we have been exchanging emails. Hey, we should talk, we should talk. So I picked up the phone. I'm like, hello. Um, and I could see the man sitting next to me, not happy. So I got up and I walked in between carts and we had a whole conversation me standing a long time between two cards, just talking about all the things we just talked about, right? It is about knowing when you are needed, right? It is about picking up that phone call, no matter where you are. And even if you can't talk to say, I'll get to you, right? I mean, that's how we show up for people. That's being a servant leader is no matter where you are, you have to show up for the people that you care about and that you've committed to, right? To see them through their journey. So I had to share that. But yes, 
so back to the book. Um, yes, I've been wanting to write a book for a long time, Tamara. Um, you know, it's one of those things that you want to do in your life and you don't find the time to do it. And then your soul doesn't let you rest at night because you're not doing what the universe wants you to do. Um, so I went through that for several years, uh, but I never had time to do it. And in a conversation with Ellen Shook, our CHRO here at Accenture, about a year and a half ago now, it was evening, we were on talking, we're seeing each other, and we're talking about what's next, what to do, all these different things. We had just come off the, the very tough, tough um, reality of the murder of George Floyd and, and my engagement around that for almost a year. Um, there was a lot going on. And Tamara, you were with me on this journey as we were doing a lot um, here in the US specifically. Um, and I, she asked me, she goes, Nelly, what do you wanna do? And I said, well, you know, when I transition out of Accenture, I wanna write, write a book and she goes, when you transition on Accenture, why do you have to wait for that to write a book? Um, and I'm like, well, you know, she goes, Nellie, she goes, you want to write a book? And I'm like, yeah, she goes, so many people benefit from the book, write your book. So Accenture sponsoring this, it goes back to conversations, everyone, right? When you want something, you, I pray on everything and I'm not pushing my spiritual belief on anybody else, but that's how I start my day and end my day. Um, and I have prayed for a while on how to make this work. Um, and the answer came. Um, and the answer came with Ellen saying, we'll sponsor it. And I also recognize it's a really important thing for everybody here in this call. Recognize when you want to do something, but you know you can't do it alone. Like I knew I couldn't do it alone because I am not a writer by nature. I'm a speaker by nature. I'm a giver. I'm a helper. I'm all these different things. But asking to sit alone and write, I don't enjoy that. So I partnered with an incredible woman. Her name is Erica Winston, um, and she's helping me just really be courageous in sharing the story. So basically, um, yeah, it's halfway and it'll come out soon. It's going to focus on, it's going to be transparent, Tamara. It's going to focus on those conversations we don't want to have. It's going to focus on ensuring how do we teach leaders, how to really recognize biases and, and actions that are impacting people. And finally, it's going to focus on how we as women, as people of color, or whatever our diversity is, um, no matter what it is, how we put barriers ourselves and how to differentiate what we're blocking ourselves with versus what others are putting in front of us, and how to really recognize the bias for what it is and not give it another label because we don't want to admit what just showed up, right? We're going to strip that label off and we're going to talk about it in a very transparent, raw, and courageous way. Yeah, I think that leads me to one of our first questions for the audience that I want to put in front of you, Nellie, which is, um, by the way, I will be the first to buy your book <laughs> and uh, I'll be showing up on whatever book tours you do because um, I'm your biggest fan. But that aside, mm -hmm. um, how do we get leaders to agree or discuss biases without concerns of offending them? How do we get, repeat that Tamara, because I'll make sure I get how do we How do we get leaders to agree or discuss biases without concerns of offending them? So this is such an interesting one because I will tell you, I talked earlier about sometimes feeling uncomfortable in some situations and, and I've had to get really comfortable with feeling uncomfortable when I have to have a conversation with people and quite honestly, call them out and bring awareness to how they're showing up in a way that goes against what we stand for, which is inclusion and equality. I've had to have those conversations and they never have been easy conversations. But what guides me is that if I don't have that conversation, then I'm allowing this person to continue to show up that way without giving them the opportunity to pause and either choose to recognize how they're showing up is not working for everybody or choose to continue behaving that way. And then there are other repercussions that come with that, right? But I cannot come from a place of just letting the uncomfort drive me and afraid of really getting to a point that I offend someone. Because if I do that, then I'm allowing them to continue to offend hundreds of people by not addressing how they're showing up. So I've had many of those conversations. Some have been intense, um, but then they've been followed up with emails thanking me because you know sometimes it takes people a while to to recognize um, what they're doing, and and sometimes it's awareness. So I I just have to get comfortable with feeling uncomfortable because it's a gift to tell somebody how they need to change how they're showing up. 
I will say it's never going to be an easy thing, right? No. And, and you know, I think, you know, Nelly, I, I'll just share my own personal story. We had a conversation recently about an interaction that I had with someone that that person didn't feel that interaction was positive, right? And they brought that to you and you brought that to me. And I think I had to challenge myself around how was I showing up? Um, and again, we have to remember, y'all, everybody's not going to be 100% every day because uh -huh. we just have a lot going on in our personal lives. We're just not always you know, going to be the happy, cheery Tamara that, you know, the accountable Nelly, right? Like these things we got to recognize we're humans. I do think what we have to remember is that conversation is important. And the key, the first step is having the courage to have the conversation. I think the second step is really being willing to be in a posture to have the conversation without it being retaliatory. And I think that you, sometimes you have to state that. Like sometimes I've gone to someone and I said, hey, I don't want to accept you. I don't want to offend you. That's not what this is about. But this circumstance happened or this conversation happened and this is how, you know, I perceived it and I want to understand from you your thoughts or, you know, I feel like in this situation, these biases are coming across and I want to understand if that's your point of view or your perspective. But I, I, I always feel that when you come to a conversation from a point of seeking to understand versus accuse uh -huh. is yep. really important in biases type conversations. It can't be the automatic that I believe your ex, right? Because we don't always understand the underlying factors behind a conversation. Um, but if you can take it from a seat to understand, I do think that that's really helpful. Um, Nellie, there was another question coming from one of our panelists around belonging. And I, you know, I'm a huge fan of this word belonging because I think that um, creating environments that are safe create environments um, of safety, create environments of belonging. And when you feel like you have belonging in an environment, you are more likely to speak up and, and, and represent your authentic self. So the panelist question is belonging means so much, especially post COVID. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for those on the front lines? Wow, so meaning on the front lines of COVID or the front lines of in general, as we're showing I think up it's probably the front lines of how do you help everybody have inclusion, diversity, and equity, mm -hmm. and a sense of belonging, just given where we are today, right? Because I think people who are serving in IND roles, I think mm -hmm. it's really hard for them to be on the front lines or have a plus one and, and, and to create these environments and feel like the burden is all on them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification, Tamara. I, you know, I it's interesting, right? Because it goes back to what I said earlier is understand your purpose, understand your level of courage and understand what you're advocating for. I, because I have that very keen sense of how I wanna show up every day and because I start my day asking for uh, wisdom as I carry on is really being able to say, am I solving for other people around me? What am I seeing that I need to solve for? What conversations do I need to have? How do I accommodate people in what they need? So I think it goes back to sensitivities are heightened right now. People are tired. People are dealing with their own sort of, you know, personal struggles um, around, you know, feeling isolated and all that. I mean, there has been such a disruption when I think, even in my own life, as I think about their days time, like you say, you show up and, and it's feeling heavier. There could be a news clip in the morning that I feel I've been impacted by it. That's created fear in me that I need to work through for the day, right? So what I tell people today now more than ever is have an awareness through what lens are you seeing people through? Are you only seeing them through your own personal experience and lens? Or are you positioning yourself to understand that there's a whole different experience others are having out there and now you allowing yourselves to see it that way? Tamara, you and I talked about this just last week, right? When people show up to calls and they're just being like, you know, a little bit, you know, disruptive um, or they're not aligned to something and you have to ask yourself what's happening, right? Is we have to ask ourselves, how are we going to respond to this? Are we giving that person the grace that they may need at the moment because we don't know what's happening in their world, especially what we're going through as, as a global community. Um, most recently, the news, Ukraine and things that are going on is we have to give people space. And if there's a conversation we need to have and say, hey, the way you showed up today was a little bit concerning. Let's talk about that instead of making a judgment 
that the person is just not aligning. We have to be so careful in how we're judging people because we don't understand people's pain points and challenges. Yeah, I used to always say that uh, we don't understand people's stories. Mm -hmm. And it's so important to, 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 if you really are operating from a place of caring, to again, go back to understanding what's going on with them and give them the, the benefit of the doubt. And, and just recognize sometimes, even if there's not something major going on with them, they just could be having a bad day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, and we, I hate to tell y'all sometimes I have a bad day. I didn't get enough sleep. I'm tired, I'm frustrated, I have allergies, <laughs> right? There could be any number of things that, that lead us down um, a path. Um, you know, I think, you know, before we close out, I had a lightning round of questions for you. And so I'm going to seek those out before I had one other thing I want to try to get to that I want to close us out on, but I'm going to jump into our lightning round of questions, right? So the first one for you, Nelly, is what is your most valuable career mistake? Not asking for help when I needed it. Oh, that's good. Let me tell y'all, that is a number one item. I am a type A++. I hate asking for help. Um, but when I took on this last role, I was I was really struggling. And Nellie reminded me, asking for help is not a sign or a lack of intelligence, which I can understand as a woman of color and a female, I feel like I'm always judged. Did she get that role? Because she's a token. Did she get that right? And so I have all these complexes. And so I hate asking for help because I don't want anyone making judgments on my intelligence. So I think that is really important. All right, second question. How do you think women professionals should embrace their differences to create positive impact for their own careers, but also for those coming up behind them? Change the narrative, just change it. Whatever you think is negative coming out of your difference, turn that to a positive. We, we've, been, we've been sort of led to believe that a lot of the greatness that comes from our difference is not great, when in fact it is. So change the narrative. I love that. You know what I used to say to people? Like I could focus on the fact that I'm the only one that looks like me in the room, or I could focus on the fact that everybody will remember me because I am the unique person in the room, right? Um, people used to say, well, Tamara, you're very direct, but do you know what my clients say? I can trust her because I know she's gonna tell me the truth. <laughs> Right. And so I love this changing the narrative because I think that is that is hugely powerful for women. Don't embrace for the box that people put you in. That is awesome. OK, next one. Um, what is let me see. What is your most single most important advice for our audience today? Oh, goodness. It is just to learn to pause and be aware of what you're feeling. Trust your intuition. Um, we get so busy. Pause and pivot when you need to pivot, but just pause. Yeah. So we were just talking about vacation, Nelly. I know. <laughs> I need to it pause. Is, it, is, it is hard to pause yes. if you don't really take time on your yeah. calendar to do so. Now, that can be a day. It could be four hours. It could be a multiple of days for me last week, right? I did, I took Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. I needed to pause. I have um, some personal things going on and, and um, I just needed to, I took the first day to, 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 to not think. <laughs> not only I needed a day to unwind and just look at the water and I just couldn't do much of anything, right? Wednesday, I was in the agitation mode of when I'm, you know, everything that's happening, it was throwing through me and I just was not, and again, but by Thursday, I was like, oh. <laughs> you're breathing again. <laughs> you're breathing again right? Just breathe, yeah. yeah. I, I, I do think that um, pausing is really um, important, right? So it's interesting, um, there was a, another question around, um, you know, advocating for yourself and changing careers and, and how do you go do that? And I just wanted to share quickly, you know, Nelly, and you were part of this as well. I was working on one account. I really wanted to make a career shift. I, I was in the succession plan. My career plan was understood, but for whatever reason, I started to get impatient with the timeline of that career path. And I realized I wanted something different. There was nothing wrong. I, I was in a situation where there was nothing wrong, actually. Mm -hmm. Like I, you could actually say it was really good. I had the, at that perfect time, I was having really great work-life integration, like, but I was like getting bored. I know that's horrible, but I just wasn't like I was growing. And, um, you know, I started doing mentoring calls uh, with Peggy Costill, who was 
very influential and help and and you know she just helped me to feel better but she helped me rethink the type of roles that I could do she helped me to rethink my skill sets can you talk to us a little bit about mentorship and sponsorship and how it can um you know how do people engage in effective sponsorship and mentorship right you you have been both a sponsor for me at times and you have been a mentor for me um, and I think that a lot of times we don't know how to leverage these relationships effectively. Yeah, Tamara, thank you for that. And I know I know we're running out of time. So really quickly, the, the best thing I can say here is value your time, your mentor's time, your sponsor's time is what do you want to get out of that relationship? And both, it should be a win-win. You should definitely educate each other. I think with sponsors, make sure you're telling them your story, what you want, put them to work. Tamara put me to work. I mean, she would say what she wanted and I would go and sponsor away and bring others along to help her, right? You gotta put your sponsors to work, feed them your story. And with mentors, you gotta ask yourself, what do you want out of this relationship? How are you gonna value this relationship? And how long do you wanna have this relationship, right? Because you're gonna switch now and then. So I would say, as you think about this is, Think about when you, when, if a mentor is assigned to you, sometimes that feels really, really, you know, sort of doesn't feel natural, doesn't feel like it's going to flow. Um, but try to identify what you have in common and what do you really want out of that relationship. When you're selecting a mentor, ask yourself, what do I know about this person already that I can learn from? Or what new things do I want to make sure we both embark on, right? I've had mentors that we've done things together. We've both learned things together. And it's just been really important. So I would say to all of you, if you can't today say who your mentor or mentors are, who your sponsor or sponsors are, the chances are you have a lot of work to do. Because it is very hard to navigate any career without having people that are pulling for you. Um, so I would say, think about that and then ask yourself, how are you going to change that gap and close that gap? Because it will be necessary to do so. Yeah. So, you know what we have, we still have uh, 10 minutes. So we have a lot. Oh, good. Okay. I was getting like, oh, <laughs> okay. so but it's interesting you say this, right? Because I still think as women, right, we have a lot to impart and I, and I fundamentally believe in our responsibility to pay it forward and to show up for others. But at the end of the day, Nellie, I can't show up for everyone. You can't show up for everyone. How do you balance self care and self focus while helping others? Like, where, where's that? Where's that line, right? Because I, I know I have had to put new boundaries in place where I can't become everyone's mentor who asks me. Mm -hmm. I do have a lot of people in my circle, so I'm usually able to connect them with someone else, right? But how how do you balance that? Because it takes time to mentor. Like we've spent real time together, Nelly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it does. And, and it goes back to listen to your body, right? I mean, I know when I am depleted. Tamara, you saw me one time depleted. You, I mean, I, mean I, I have advocated for people. I sponsor people. And what I do in the process is a lot of times I put my needs last, right? Because sometimes, quite honestly, it's a lot easier to solve for others than it is for you to admit what you need to solve for yourself, right? So, so there's that dynamic that goes into it as well. But your body will tell you. I mean, you will know when you're losing sleep. You will know when your neck hurts that you can't turn it. You will know when you're walking, you feel exhausted because you just went up three flights of stairs. I mean, you will know <laughs> when you're not paying attention to your body. You know when you eat too much sugar and you feel exhausted all day long. I have learned throughout my journey how to pay more attention to what my body and my spirit is telling me. Um, and that takes discipline and it takes time. I wish I would have learned this a lot earlier. My daughter who's in her thirties, I mean, she learned this very early on and I'm a little jealous that I didn't, right? I think the younger generation, the more junior generation is starting to get to that a, a lot quicker than we have gotten there or that I have gotten there. But here's the thing, Tamara, right? Um, when you're so focused on, you know, advocating for people and solving for people, what happens is it comes very natural. So when it comes that natural, it's natural for you to put yourself aside and deal with that first. So I'm trying to make it natural to also want to advocate for myself. So I ask myself, how am I advocating for me this week? What does that mean? Does that mean that I shut down one day early? And does that mean that I read a fiction book and just escape? Then that's what it means, right? 
but it's the discipline to put yourself in the shoes of advocating for you as well. You know, we're, we're, as we're getting closer to our closeout, I, I didn't want to leave without talking about the fact that you can't always feel confident. Mm -mm. I know that people look at you, they look at me and they think, oh my gosh, she really has it together. Look at what she's accomplished and look at all these awards and look at all this. And, and honestly, Nelly, you're, you're pretty phenomenal, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I think of the, the poem, right? Phenomenal woman, right? There's, there's Nelly's name right next to it. But you don't always feel confident, do you? Do you feel anxiety? Do you feel worry? Do you, how do you deal with when you don't feel on top of your game? Um, how do you deal with these little imposter syndrome, you know, voices in our head that come up for all of us on occasion? Yeah, Tamara, and thank you for calling that out, right? I mean, I, I, the best thing I could say here is I remember one particular day that I found myself most of the day having conversations advocating for other people, knowing full well that at the end of that day, I needed to have a conversation to advocate for me because I did not like the way things were going at that point in time and that point in my journey, my career. And all day long, I'm having all these conversations and, and as I'm talking to people that I'm advocating for, I'm not telling them, hey, I'm going through the same struggle. I'm not saying, hey, what you just said is something I'm experiencing, right? But I was, and I was struggling to try to navigate for myself. So I wasn't very confident in advocating for me, but I was very confident advocating for everybody else. But here's the thing. I had that conversation later that day as if I was advocating for someone else. It just happened to be me. And I said, I am not going to let all these other filters get in the way. I'm going to do what, what I do for others. I'm going to do it for me. When you do that and when you have and when you change that mindset, what happens is you start to feel so good about yourself because you are courageous to show up for you. You start to recognize that you are as important to you as all these other people you agree to advocate for. It takes time, it takes awareness. And they're calls, Tamara, that I get on to this day that I know before I get on that call, I better go in a Zen moment. I better have my meditation ready because I'm about to get onto a call that's gonna be intense, right? Um, whether, it's, whether it's going into breathing exercise, whether it's going into prayer, whatever it is, I have the awareness of when I need to tell myself this is not going to be an easy call. So I'm gonna call upon all of what's around me, the good energy to help see me through it. Um, and, but that's the best thing I do because there are days that I wake up feeling like it's gonna be the best day on earth. There are days I wake up and say, oh, today is gonna be rough. It's gonna be tough, but you just gotta work through it and you just gotta have the awareness. So that's why I said before with that question, you know, what's the best advice you could give anyone is be aware of how you're feeling and then decide what actions you need to take based on how you're feeling. But in the process, you have to advocate for yourself. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's interesting. Um, you know, someone had asked, you know, what do you do to push aside imposter syndrome? And imposter syndrome is a hard thing. I, what, and what I can tell you is one, do exactly what Nellie said, advocating for yourself. I think two, you gotta write down your achievements. Mm -hmm. You got to celebrate graduating from college or you got to celebrate having your kids or you got to celebrate that you've been married X amount of years. You got to celebrate that you've made it through this, these career steps or that you're in this role. I think we don't spend a lot of time celebrating where we are in our journey. And I think, um, you know, for me, I have a negative voice. I name it hater. Right. And I just have to tell my hater, like, it's time for you to be quiet today. Um, we have negative voices and I'm a big fan of, of, of shutting down the negative voice. And then the third is, I think you've got to write out your story and writing out your story. However, you do that in PowerPoint or a word document, you need to write out your current story, right? And you need to share that with your leaders, your peers, those above you and those when, and get their feedback on your story. Believe it or not, in, in sharing your story, you're advocating for yourself. Um, it's something that is really helpful and then also in getting real feedback from others on yourself it will also shut down some of those negative voices because often how we see ourselves is not how others see us um, and so i think that's that's really important um, there was a final question around and then i'm gonna i'm gonna close us out we got about four minutes uh nally 
um, how do you get sponsorships? And sponsorships are a hard thing because sometimes a person has to choose to be your sponsor. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes you got to put yourself out there so people can see you to even know to be a sponsor for you. Um, but if there was one piece of advice that you would give someone on how to get a sponsor, what would it be, Nellie? Yeah, and I'll get to that, Tamara, but I want to elaborate on what you said is that uh, negative inner voice. That is so important because we all have it. No matter how much you have achieved in your journey, there are going to be days that it's just there. And I had that recently. I mean, I'm looking at this wall that I have in my room and it has all those awards. All those awards are there. I mean, they're all beautiful and they're there. And yet that one particular day, I was feeling like none of that mattered because I was dealing with a very challenging situation. And that inner voice was just, you know, causing havoc. And just like you name yours, you know, I name mine. And it's just, you have, you have to have that awareness to do that. So I think for all of you, recognize we all have it and recognize that we all have to put it aside and we have to shut it down. So I wanted to share that. What a sponsor I would say to people is identify where you are in your journey, in your setting, in your organization, and ask yourself, who are the leaders here that have the power and the influence to be able to get me to the next level. A sponsor is someone that has enough power and enough influence to really solve for helping you get there. So if the person that you have identified in the past does not sit where they need to sit to be able to advocate for you in a meaningful way, then you have to rethink who that sponsor needs to be. So remember, a mentor is going to be someone that's going to help you navigate, learn new skills. It's going to help you evolve and look at the culture in a more holistic way. A sponsor is someone that has the power to change the trajectory of your career and to get to the next level because they are already in that room where things happen. I love that. As we start to close out, um, in these last two minutes, I'm a huge fan of um, focusing on a word. And, you know, a word can be for the day, the week, the month, or the year. Um, and if you had to leave this audience with a word today, Nelly, what would that word be? Oh, there's so many. Okay, I'll pick. Um, it's my favorite word, is courage. It's my favorite word. I, I, I pull it out every single day for whatever, whatever situation I'm in, just courage, that's mine. Mine today is grace. <laughs> uh -huh. I hope for all of the women internationally and locally that you give yourself grace, grace in your journey, whatever that means for you, um, that you give yourself some grace to achieve where you need to go, some grace to forgive what you haven't done, some grace to take the time that you need, some grace to recognize that you're not perfect and can't be superwoman every day. Mm -hmm. um, it's grace. I think that uh, grace is um, our friend. There's a quote by William Hazlitt that said, grace in women has more effect than beauty. I think we, we all can live, give, provide, and operate with a little bit more grace and uh, definitely with courage. I hope that y'all enjoyed your time with Nellie and I today. We appreciated the opportunity to be with you. I hope you got some pearls of wisdom. We will be happy to link with you on LinkedIn. I saw some of y'all ask about that. And we just wanna say thanks to each of you. And we celebrate all the women on International Women's Day. Thank you.